So with that, um, let's get launched into it. I'm going to share my screen here and show you what we have going. Okay, so that should be visible. Hopefully it's visible to everybody. Um, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sarah. So I've got it um, in my um, program. I have it set up to match an eight and a half by 11 inch page, letter size. Um, because that's probably gonna be the easiest page for most people to um, access. But you know, whatever size works for you. <clears throat> the main thing is <clears throat> we plan it out so that we have enough space for the animal. So what I'm gonna do first is show you a picture of what it'll look like that we're we're aiming toward, and, you know, how big it'll be on the on the screen or on the page, and then how um, how it'll look basically. So uh, I'm going to give you a preview um, because I've done this sort of ahead of time. Um, the uh, you you've probably seen the advertisement for it. This is the the image that I provided for that. So that's kind of like if you wanted to color it in afterwards, you can make it look like um, you know, a nice colorful picture of the rockfish. And that's the size we're going at. Um, however, we're also, uh, this is the, this is basically what it's gonna look like uh, once we're finished today. That's gonna be our drawing, that's what, we're, what I'm using as a reference. So something that I've prepared ahead of time. Um, and then we're going to build that up and, um, and make a drawing out of it from scratch. And so that's what it'll look like. And now we're gonna start um, from scratch and uh, just keep in mind the size of it. You can see it takes up the center of your page and leave a little bit of space on each side, but it'll be easy because the first lines that we draw will establish most of the size of it. So that'll help, okay? Oops, Tycho is going here. Um, there we go. So now, oopsie. Make sure he doesn't pull out my cable. So I'm gonna start by um, yeah, so if you want to use a pencil for this, um, then that'll be the best. And um, I'm going to use a, a black color here. You can use whatever color you want, it works. So the first thing that we're going to do is, um, I like to kind of break down these into simpler shapes to begin with. And so we're gonna actually make this shape kind of like very much to start with, very much like a, um, like one of those sort of caricatural pictures of a fish. So that'll make it easier to kind of uh, see what's happening. The first thing you wanna do is think of like a stretched out lemon or maybe a football, kind of a stretched out football. We're gonna make this kind of a shape that's gonna take up and you saw how big the fish was gonna be in, in the initial sort of preview picture. So I'm gonna make a, or it looks kind of almost like a flying saucer from the side, but basically like a stretched out lemon with sort of Two kind of points, kind of like an oval that's gotten got the two points on the ends. Basically, that's going to be our. Um, let's see, let me just make sure I'm on the right layer here. Yes, that's going to be our um, our basic fish shape. That's the body of the fish. So, if you were here drawing the marmot last time uh, with us, uh, you. Notice that one we built up in a very different way from the nose outward. Uh, and so it kind of was hard to see how big it would get ultimately, but this is different. We've got, we've got it starting from most of the body of the, the fish. That makes it easier. Then also uh, we're gonna have to put a tail on it. So here's where it looks like, whoopsie, where it looks kind of like, um, almost like a cartoon fish, you know. Hang on, let's see, there we go. Julius, sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, there's a question about if you, if it's possible to change the background to white. Oh yeah, it's sure. hard okay. to see against the blue. Right. Okay. Good point. Yes. Yes, I can do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you bet. And um, yeah. And if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free. Um, I won't be able to monitor that. But if 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 Sierra or Maya, if you want to interject with anything that is sort of a timely kind of a question, then I'm happy to. Woo! Check the color. Okay, <laughs> we're just gonna shut, there we go. How's that? Does that look okay? Um, I'm not seeing it on my screen yet, but maybe oh, okay. it's just a delay. Hmm, oh, okay. it's changing. <laughs> okay, so then that must be that there's a little bit of a delay. I'll keep that in mind. Now, now it's white. Okay, good, good, excellent. Um, Thank you. You're welcome, yeah, thanks. That's a good suggestion actually, yes. 
Okay, great. So there's there's our fish body and and what's going to be the tail. So basically, oh, actually, now I should probably, I'm going to have to change one thing here um, because of the change in, let me just verify. Okay. Give me one second here. Um, the, uh, I just want to verify that I'm done. Okay, here, that's what I'll do. I'll just turn this up a little bit. Good. Okay, yes, we're good. Okay, so now we've got the fish all set up kind of in, in, in its overall shape. And um, so I want to pay attention to the, the basically the, the, the relative size of these different shapes and, you know, where they're positioned. So for the tail here, we've got it kind of coming off the end of the, that, that kind of lemon shape. Um, and that'll help us to place it on, on, on the page overall. So now what I'd like you to do is very likely um, for this next part, uh, very lightly we want to sketch in some lines. This is because these next lines won't stay in the final uh, artwork, but they'll help us to kind of guide the position of some of our subsequent lines. So I want you to very lightly draw kind of a set of um, like cross lines over it. And the way this will work is you want to think about where the centers of these are. So these, actually, I don't need that dark happening here. I'm just going to adjust that. This might interfere otherwise. Actually, let's change this one here. Okay, good. Yeah, so basically, um, this will help us to place certain other features of the fish afterwards. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in a different color. If you have a different color, this is great to put it in as well. I'm just gonna put this in red for now. So um, basically you want to make a kind of a line through the center of your lemon and then horizontally, and then look at where the halfway point is on the shape as well, side to side, and then draw a line that crosses the first one up and down. And again, remember, these are very light, faint lines because we don't want them too much to interfere. I can adjust the brightness on my computer so that makes it easier. And I'm making it dark so you can see it, but just remember these are light. And then make a, um, basically cross through it so that you look for the point uh, between in any one of these quarters that is halfway down the length of your um, lemon shape and then join those lines like this through the center. And then on the last two quarters, mark the halfway point in these bits of line and draw a line through those and through the center of this whole sort of crossing complex there. Now we've got a really, well, it kind of looks like a spider web <clears throat> a little bit now, a part of a spider web. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch back to black now because these are just guidelines here. But because it's kind of a, you know, the fish has a particular look to its face and the position of its fins, we want to make that accurate because we're looking at a very particular fish species. So rockfish are wonderful. Um, we have about 38 species of them off the west coast of, of BC. Um, they are beautifully colored, many of them. There's such a rich diversity of colors from brilliant red ones, the vermilion rockfish. Um, the canary rockfish has some yellow spots and, and blotches on it to the, the black rockfish is quite dark gray and, and has blotches as well. And then the China rockfish has this beautiful, it's dark colored and has this yellow line along the length of its body and it comes from the, the first dorsal fin. The Boccaccio rockfish that we're doing now is, um, has very well color. Uh, the young have kind of a, a kind of a bronzy color and as it ages uh, the adults can vary from sort of an olive colored back to red color to orange and then a lighter colored belly and then there's little kind of speckly splotches on it and it has a lighter colored lateral line which we'll learn about as we draw that. Okay, so that's there. Now we can put its eye in place. Now that we have these lines, the eye <clears throat> Excuse me. The eye goes. Actually, I guess I'll. Yeah. Um, yes. Here we go. 
the eye will go kind of just below that halfway point um, on the lemon shape that's on the top left. So it'll look like this, about this size. So you can kind of, I find that easier to place these smaller shapes once I have these kinds of guidelines in place, because it's easier for the eye to compare the, the relative distances um, to smaller subshapes within the overall thing, rather than to look at the entire piece. And you can put a, a pupil in it. It's the dark spot in the center, like in our eyes, which is the, the hole in, the, in the, the muscular iris, which is the colored part. And this hole is what allows light to enter uh, into the eye and form an image on the, which is retina. Um, cool thing about many fish species from deep water and the Boccaccio rockfish is from sort of intermediate depths uh, between about 50 to 300 meters depth or something close to that. Some fish, and including a lot of sharks, have a very highly reflective layer on the back of their eye on their retina called the tapetum lucidum. And that's why they kind of look reflective and glow when you shine a light at them um, or, or, or kind of glow green. Um, so if you see that in, in your cats and dogs, and, and, and you can see the spiders too, if you shine a light on, on, on the lawn in the summer, you see these little dots of lights. Um, these are um, reflective uh, uh, bits on the back of the eyes, really neat sort of thing. Okay, so that's our eye. Okay. Now the mouth. So keep in mind, when we're doing this, this mouth here is going to make it look like it's a very grumpy fish, but that's only because um, we're seeing part of the mouth. Okay, so start at the very, almost the tip of the lemon shape. Now, here's where you want to pay attention. It's just slightly up from the tip of the lemon shape where you begin. So slightly above that halfway, it looks like this. And it, it kind of bends downward a bit and goes just beyond the back of the eye. So it looks grouchy. Looks like a grouchy fish. It's actually... One of the things about the Boccaccio rockfish, as Sierra was saying, the name Boccaccio um, in Italian means sort of big mouth. And this species of rockfish has an exceptionally large mouth. Um, the neat thing about these kinds of fish, these bony fish that have a large mouth, is that they have the ability, that the reason why the jaws are set up in such a way is that they, they um, do what's called suction feeding. And so they, they will open their mouth wide really fast, and that creates a negative pressure that sucks in water and whatever is in the water and trained in it into the mouth. And so it's kind of a trap and they can catch small prey like fish or squid or whatever by literally sucking them into their mouth, which is wide open. So the bigger the mouth, uh, the larger amount of water and prey that can be swallowed and the stronger the current that's generated in the suction. So it's a very effective feeder that way. So having a big mouth in the water is very useful if you feed by suction feeding. So that's the- Very cool facts, Julius. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Such neat animals. Um, and, yeah. And so another way to, you know, to remember more about why its mouth is so large, it's very effective at feeding. And these guys hang on the bottom mostly with lots of uh, various kinds of animals. Um, although the juveniles hang out uh, in uh, kelp forests and other types of very spatially complex environments. And so another reason why it's very important for us to conserve and protect kelp forests and to promote their growth by um, a couple of things. One, to reduce the effects of climate change because that uh, interferes, the warming water interferes with with kelp forest development, and also because it upsets the ecological balance in that it can cause, in some cases, and the loss of species can also cause the overabundance of things like urchins that eat kelp and that prevent the, the formation of kelp forests, which are, of course, important for the young of these fish and many, many other fish. So it's all connected, as Sierra was saying, it's all interconnected by uh, fascinating um, sort of ecological um, uh, phenomena. Uh, and processes that, that transfer energy and materials between different species. Okay, so now we're going to draw the fish's kind of a part of it, its, um, its gills. So remember, so these are bony fish and they have one large operculum, which is a cover to the gills, um, which are where it, the gas is exchanged. So they pick up oxygen from the water and deposit carbon dioxide into the water. 
So you start up here near the um, sort of in, in that, that second quadrant or second eighth of the, of the, the star shape we made. And you kind of go, now keep in mind this, the shape I'm making is gonna be a bit of a, a, a upward curvature to it. Then it pretty much goes as far as the center line. And then there's a bit of a, a corner and then it comes down like this, downward and to the left. And at the very bottom, it curves around to underneath the mouth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Doesn't connect with the mouth. It connects sort of with where the lower jaw is. So bony fish have a very complex set of bones in the head, many, many bones in the head. And in the, particularly also in the, this apparatus that protects the gills, the operculum. This is part of what we're seeing here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And different fish have different shaped gill covers or curriculi. Uh, this is part of this one. So the tail, uh, we're going to kind of connect it with the body a little bit. So this is the tail stalk. You're going to go to the back end of the fish to just, the, just before the lemon shape ends. And we're going to connect it to the tail with this sort of curved line like that on top. And then on underneath as well, just to kind of give it a bit of a thickness, muscles. Um, this, this part of the tail is very important for the fish to be able to swish its tail so that it can propel itself forward very powerfully. And then of course, there's also a little, you can make a little dotted line or just a light line here, curved crescent shape in the tail. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's where the actual, the, the, the fish's backbone, the vertebrae end. Um, it goes into the tail and that's where the body actually ends. And then there are these fin rays that come into the tail. We'll see it afterward. Okay. Now we need other fins, right? For this fish to swim and to be able to swim effectively in the water and, and to steer, we need fins. Uh, so we have what's called a dorsal fin, it's the fin on the back of the fish. It has two dorsal fins. The first dorsal fin, um, we're gonna draw the outline to it. So do this lightly, okay? Cause we want to, use this more as a guide to the end of all of the spines. This fish has, so this, I'm gonna draw kind of a little dotted line on top like this, kind of a curved arch on top. And remember the front end is kind of a little bit straighter and then it, it curves gently toward the back. And then you can see that there's a shallower point where it connects with the body like that. The reason why we're doing this lightly is because this fin is actually composed of a bunch of spines, sharp spines, and we'll want to draw those spines. Um, and I'll show you in a second how that works, but for now we just want to outline it. Now there's a second dorsal fin as well, further down the back. This one starts up pretty much just after where that first one ends. And you start here, um, very close to where that one ended. And this one we can draw with a solid line. It goes up to the right, and then it curves at the point, you know, uh, changes direction mostly in that line, that cross line we drew. There's a bit of an arch toward the tail. And then just before we hit the tail, it curves back like that and connects with the body of the fish. Mm -hmm. There are two dorsal fins. These are useful for, for keeping the fish stable as it's swimming. Um, so basically, yeah, they're, they're kind of like, like wings or like the, like the tail fins of an airplane in some ways. Um, so now we also need other fins. Uh, there are a pair of fins called the pectoral fins just behind the gill uh, cover or operculum. These are equivalent to our arms. In fact, in those fish that left the water um, around the Devonian period, uh, these are the fins that evolved into arms in that lineage of vertebrates. So you're gonna start pre pretty much at the center of this whole cross of lines we drew in red. And you'll go from there up slightly to the right. And it's kind of a lobe or like a large crescent shape like this. And then you can also draw the place where it kind of connects with the body. There's a little bit of a, a little chunkiness in the body there. So just kind of a little crescent like that. That's our pectoral fin, the left pectoral fin. You can't see the right one because it's on the other side of the fish. And these fish have relatively narrow bodies side to side. So they're tall and deep, but narrow side to side. And so um, 
a lot like a lot of bony fish not all of them some of them are flatter and there are rock fish that are a lot lower down sort of more like a sports car and wider in their body um and and there's quite wonderful shape diversity in them now there's another fin on the bottom of the fish that's not paired but is a single central fin and that's the anal fin that's just before the tail and we're going to use those cross lines that we drew again to help us position it this one happens it starts out just behind the point where that that cross that um uh, the, the, the diagonal line comes out of the lemon shape on the lower right. It comes out like this and it changes direction like that and is more triangular than the other ones we drew and then comes back to meet the body like that. And so that one helps it to, again, keep stable um, and probably helps a little bit in propulsion Probably not very much though, um, because it's very close to the end of the tail. So if the tail swishes, this kind of swishes too, but it's mostly for keeping it stable in, in so the fish doesn't like spin around as it's, as it's um, swimming forward, it stays vertical up and down. The body helps with that, but so do the fins even more so. That's the anal fin. Now we have another set of paired fins, the pelvic fins, which um, are equivalent to our legs. And, and which um, in, in those fish that left the water um, through a long process of evolution, we evolved into legs and hind legs. The first one happens, it starts out pretty much just to the left of where that vertical line comes uh, and crosses the lemon shape. And it's kind of a swept back triangle. It comes down like this, just below our pectoral fins, and then turns back and ends up here. And in fact, you can then do another little curve like that because there's kind of a thickened uh, bony ray at the front edge of this fin. And so that's what we're seeing here. That kind of, that kind of double line on the front edge um, corresponds to, it, it represents that thickened ray, thickened bony ray basically. That's the left pelvic fin. Now, but because these pelvic fins are on the bottom of the fish, uh, pretty much on its belly. You can see the right one as well. And so we'll draw that now. That one happens on the right side of the fish. And we're seeing this fish mostly from the side, but it's slightly turned toward us, just a little bit toward us. So it's, it's facing, its face is just a little bit more towards us. So you can actually see that these two fins are gonna be offset. You're going to see this one start up in front of where we drew the other one. And it comes and then changes direction right at that vertical line. It comes down like this. Now, the front and back edge of this are at a different angle than the, than the left pelvic fin that we drew because these pelvic fins come off the fish at an angle. So I'm, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to draw you a quick little sketch of what it looks like in cross-section. So here's the body of the fish in cross-section. We were to look at it head on. It's kind of a, maybe it's a little wider than that, but it's pretty close. The fins that we're seeing that we just drew are these pelvic fins, and they come like this. If you looked at it from the front, they would be coming out of the fish like that edge on. That's what we're seeing. And those two pectoral fins that we drew, those ones, would come off it from the front. It looks like this, basically. That gives you an idea. And of course, your anal fin comes up here and your dorsal fins come off the top. Anyway, so that's kind of what we're seeing here. So that's all of the fins of the fish now. Now we're going to add some details. Just check on time here. here we go. Okay, good, good. We've got time. So now we want to refine the details of the fish. Now we have the whole fish drawn out in its shape. Basically, you've got the entire plan. And you know this is, looks almost complete, but we're gonna make it better because this fish has certain characteristics that help distinguish it from other species. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do, and I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see it better. So we're gonna give it a proper shaped forehead because the way we drew it was kind of a good introduction. But there is something, um, particular about this species that helps helps it to define it as a species of rockfish that it is. Uh, and that is that the forehead is slightly concave or like dented in compared to some other ones. It's not like what we have here is 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 convex, it's bulging outward, but it's going to be dented inward. So you're going to go to the top near where the the first dorsal fin connects the body. And from there um, 
I'm going to draw this line that just slightly starts to go in from the body like that. And then at the eye, it changes direction and comes back outward to meet that line that we drew first like that. So you can see all we've done, done basically is dented a little bit the edge of the line at the eye. It kind of changes direction there. What you can actually do is that first line that we drew, um, which is uh, this one here, we can actually just kind of erase out the outer part of that line. So I'm going to do that now. So just carefully erase out this part just a little bit that's outside of our um, of the new line we drew. So now we have a proper shaped forehead, more or less, for this fish. And this is one of the features that's used to help identify the species. Okay. The other thing that we want to do here with this line along the forehead is help def um, define the, the mouth. And this has a really neat shaped mouth. Um, it is a very chinny fish. Okay. It has a very, very sticking out chin. And the chin uh, extends far beyond the upper jaw or the sort of the upper lip, if you like. And we're going to draw in the, the position of that upper lip where, where that top jaw ends. And so you're going to go to, like, it's going to start right here. And you're going to draw it down a curve to meet like that. The reason we're doing that is because that is where the upper jaw actually ends. And now we can erase out the bit of line that we initially drew to define that lemon shape, but only on the top jaw. This lower jaw stays that long, like we drew initially. Okay? So now this fish has a very serious underbite, right? It's like it's you've got like a, a bulldog face happening, sort of like where its lower jaw extends further than its upper jaw. If it had big teeth, it would hang it right out, right? So, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't have big teeth that hang out. It just has a lower jaw that extends quite a bit beyond the upper jaw, but it gives it a very particular look, and this is helpful for identifying this species of rockfish. Um, not all rockfish are like this. Many other ones have a much more you know, um, smooth front end of their face. This guy is, is, is great. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a grouchy look. I think it's cute. Um, it's a fun fish. Well, white fish aren't fun. Right? But really, this is a fun fish. Uh, They're all fun. They're all fun. But exactly. yeah, very cool <laughs> fish. And uh, I just loved when I figured out, oh, well, of course, Boccaccio means big, big mouth. Exactly. I thought, yep. <laughs> it's appropriate. It totally Makes is. Sense. Oh, and actually, the, the scientific name of this, um, which I have here at the bottom, right? Uh, Sebastes pausospinus. Sorry, that's actually, um, it's sometimes mis- misspelled, so I, I'm just going to fix that. It's actually spinous with an I-S. Yeah, like that. So, Sebastes um, is Greek for um, marvelous, um, kind of or spectacular, beautiful stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful fish. And, um, and it knows it, right? But uh, pausus spinous um, comes from two root words, um, which means few uh, spines. So, uh, that's referring to the number of spines. So you, various rockfish have different numbers of spines in their fins. And this one is on the lower number. Um, and so scientific names are usually quite helpful and, and help to, um, they, they, they usually incorporate some feature of the fish that the, the, the scientific um, uh, writer, the, the scientist who's describing them um, formally chooses to include. And in this case, one of the features was the sort of the relative number of spines. So there you go. So a little bit more name information about it. Um, and then we'll continue by doing the upper jaw details. Okay, so now we're going to start to put the kind of like the, the lips of the fish in. This will make it look a lot more realistic. Okay, so first the upper jaw. Um, and what happens here is that that line we drew was the edge of the mouth, but it's more complex than that when you look at it. So we're going to go toward the end of that mouth uh, where it, it was turned downward in that frown. We're going to going to continue that upward, like this, and back toward, and 
now this is not the open mouth. This is toward the front, like that. And then there's another little line that kind of the dotted line comes back from the tip of the mouth and it comes back downward toward the bottom. What's happening here is that is the, um, there's kind of a thickened uh, bony part on the upper lips. And these are part of the structures that are used to hinge the jaws together um, and uh, that allow the jaws to flex and open up really wide and so on. So fish have these thickened, um, they look like lips almost, they're not lips, but they look a little bit like lips. And in addition to that, we're also going to add one more line here to this upper jaw, and that will define the inside of the mouth. Now, what, what I mentioned before was that this fish is mostly from the side, but is facing us a little bit. It's turned a little bit toward us. So we can actually see not only the second pelvic fin that we drew underneath it, but the inside of the mouth a little bit. So it's gonna happen like this. So again, at the, the front tip, is gonna be this line that you draw like this. Basically, and then you can kind of shade that in too between the uh, lower jaw and that line you drew. Because that is the dark sort of inside of the mouth. It's not really dark, but darker because it's shaded, right? So um, it's preventing light from getting in too much. But that's the, the mouth is just slightly open there. Now that's significant because uh, a lot, most fish, um, the way they breathe, well, all fish, the way they breathe is they take in water through the mouth and it goes inside of their, uh, pharynx uh, inside of their mouth, and then it exits through uh, the gills, uh, through the gill slits. And those, that operculum that we drew was um, what covers the gills. And the gills actually have a series of bony arches. And those arches support these um, wonderful, brilliant red colored filaments. Those are the gill filaments. And they're bright red because they have a lot of blood flowing through them. And they're bright red also because the the layer of skin on them is extraordinarily thin because that is necessary for easy exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the surface. So the water comes in through the mouth and out through the gills and fish often swim with their mouth open for this reason or opening and closing and they pump water over those gill slits sometimes or just because when they swim forward, the water uh, rushes in past the gills. So that's why a lot of the time you do see fish with their mouth open. Sharks do this a lot. Um, bony fish do this a lot. And so here we have a rockfish with its mouth just slightly open. So there we go. Okay, so that's our upper jaw. Now we're going to go to the lower jaw. And the lower jaw, um, again, because this fish is slightly turned toward us and because we're seeing it ever so slightly from below, we can see the bottom of the, so the jawline. So like where our jaw angles, right? Under our chin. And start from the bottom chin and just draw this, you know, a dotted line maybe, or, or just a light line that comes back like this. And ends just above, it curves up a bit, just above where our gill cover ended. But notice there's a gap between the two. Don't join them. Out some of these arrows we don't need. That's a different layer. Okay, so that's kind of our, our lower jawline. And in addition to that, we also want this line that comes from, again, where we started this line, another sort of very light line, kind of curves like this and follows the, and joins up with pretty much the mouth. Okay. So, when the fish's mouth is, is wide open, some of these bones will be much more obvious, but when its mouth is closed, there are some of these bones that kind of show up uh, as overlapping each other. So the mouth, the lower jaw is fit inside of the upper jaw in this case. That's what we're seeing here. And so now up on the tip of the, of the lower jaw here, um, it does extend, you notice quite a bit beyond the upper jaw, but what's missing here but is found in many other rockfish is what's called a symphysial knob. It's a mouthful, uh, no pun intended, dealing with the mouth here, but there's some of these fish have an extra bump uh, coming out of the, the place where the, the two 
bones uh, of the lower jaw meet, uh, the, the synthesis. Uh, and so these one, this one doesn't have it. But ironically, it also has a very long chin, even though it doesn't have that knob that's projecting out. So anyway, there's a bit of trivia about the, the jaws of the fish, okay? And now we're gonna finish up the gill cover, the operculum. Uh, so for this, you know, don't worry if the lines aren't all in there, it's, it's not a big deal. You already have a large part of it, but if you wanna make it accurate, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the top part of that gill where we ended, we're gonna continue forward from that with a little dotted line toward almost horizontal toward the top of the fish like that. And then there's a kind of a, a line, again, sort of a lighter line that is a little crescent shape, like this. That joins those two. Remember where we drew that bit of a, a dent on top of the of the curriculum where it kind of dented downward? Well, that's that's why there's this other line that joins. It's it's got a complex shape to percolum. It's really neat, all the different bones in them. They're really neat. So we're not gonna draw all the bones and stuff, but there are a few lines that kind of help to define it. The other main one here is, remember how we said that we we're going to take that lower jaw line of the fish and not connect it with the bottom of the operculum or gill cover? Well, here's why. We're gonna go to the back corner of the jaw, of the, sorry, of the gill operculum, which is marked now by this dark arrow here. We're gonna start there and you're gonna draw a line that comes down diagonally. And then as you cross over those red lines, you'll curve it forward and then curve down again, and that actually meets this jawline, okay? like that. And then there's a couple of small um, dotted lines that come forward from this upper corner of the gill curcule like that, and then one from that big corner at the back, like that, those two lines. These are just ridges that happen on the, on the gill cover um, and they're different for every fish. And then the last thing that we need to do is there's one more line on the gill that starts from near the front end of the, the corner and it comes down like this. And then it changes direction at the center horizontal line and comes down like that. And that's it, wow. That's a complex set of lines for the gill cover. Like, what, can't they just get it simple? Just take a simple disc shape, right? I mean, wow. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're really neat that way. Uh, there's actually a little bit more that we're gonna add to it afterwards, but start there for now, okay? So that, that's the main thing. Whew, we can breathe now. That's a complex set of lines, but it makes the fish give it personality, you know? Actually, we're gonna, we're gonna put a couple of those lines in right now. Here's the neat thing. These, these operculi or these covers are really complex, but they help to help the fish to breathe, as I was mentioning. They direct water effectively through this space where the gills are. And there are these special rays of bone that come out of the jaws that help to hold this, uh, this membrane, this gill membrane in place. They're, they're called branchiostegal rays. I'm just gonna draw a couple of lines this is how it's going to happen. So we're going to start, first of all, I'm going to erase out some of these, these arrows so that you don't get confused with all of the arrows I'm talking about um, because I want to uh, point us in the direction of, of um, what we're dealing with at the moment. But, so what we're going to do is I'm going to point you down here. Um, we're going to draw a line coming from the point where the chin line comes you know, in turns direction, and it'll come up and make an arch shape like this. Okay. And another one below it, similar, and it'll end a little bit, oops, it'll, end, oops, it'll end a little bit sooner like that. And one more, you can do more, several of these, but one more that comes above that first one, and curves back like this. These are each individual rays of bone that come from the back of the jaw, sort of the corner of the jaw area, and go underneath some of that operculum. And they support kind of a membrane. Um, they make kind of a plate of sorts. And the fish can move these. And when you, when you look at a fish underneath its chin, you'll see these, these, these lines, a bony fish that is, these lines um, that look kind of like an accordion. Um, and that's what you're looking at. These, 
these branchiostegal rays. And in fact, there are more of them. If you wanted to add, there's some to go forward like this. And you'll see sometimes pictures of fish and they have those lines uh, that come along the bottom. Well, that's what we're looking at. It's a very complex set of, of, of anatomy, but they make the fish what they are. And bony fish are very complex in these, these covers. Okay, now we're gonna switch over to the, to the fins. We've got that whole complex area. This is the, probably the hardest part of the fish to draw, that, that operculum. So good for you for getting through this. Uh, now we're just gonna add some rays to the fins. These are the, the bony parts that help support the fins, that give them strength and structure. So up to the second dorsal fin, just basically draw these lines that come, several of these lines. You know how fish have these rays of bone? that helps support the fins. You can There's a certain number of them, but we're not gonna to be too particular right now. Just draw several of these to make it simple. And if you really wanna get accurate about this, some of these rays actually are kind of fork shaped in that they, they have, they split along the way from starting from the animal's body outward, about halfway through they split and they widen because this way they cover more of that that sort of the membrane of the fin. You don't have to draw these in, but if you're interested, that's kind of what happens with a lot of these. They kind of split. You get more rays for the price of one, basically. And then the same thing happens with the, the anal fin on the bottom here. You get these bunch of rays. I'm gonna go faster with these ones because we know what's going on already. Uh, again, also with the pelvic fins, pretty much all of these fins, but leave the first dorsal fin because we're gonna do something special with that. You can draw these rays in for all of the fins. With the tail fin, um, the way it happens actually is that on the, the outside, okay, from, from the center, yeah, they, they, the rays come out like this, and then they kind of follow parallel to the, the edge of the fin. But when you get to the very edges, they don't quite go as far as the very end of the fin. So maybe halfway like that. Again, on the bottom side, parallel-ish, and then toward the end, you don't quite go all the way out to the end of the fin, like that. Okay, those are the rays. Oh, and then the pectoral fin, right? The, the, the paired fin that corresponds to our arms. Okay, so now we have one of the defining features of teleosts or bony fish. Um, these are not like sharks and rays, but bony fish like pike and walleye and rockfish, they have these, these distinctive rays in their fins to give them strength. Now with the, the first dorsal fin, I mentioned it has spines. These fish are slow moving, usually hanging around the bottom. And as such, they're great targets for predators like seals, for example, will eat these fish or larger fish will eat them. Um, and so they need protection, right? So they have wonderful built-in protection in the form of spines. This first dorsal fin is actually a series of really sharp spines. So if you've ever held a fish, you have to be careful sometimes because some of these fins have really sharp bony spines. And so this one is no exception. You're going to draw these, like the first, remember how I said how that fin, there's this bit of a corner in the front end of it. That's because that's where the first spine ends. So we're gonna draw uh, a completed like that. This is, this is a sharp, hard spine, with a very sharp tip. And some of these rockfish have poisonous spines actually. So it's not just that, that a predator trying to eat them can get poked painfully, but they can actually get injected with poison. So good reason for them to try to avoid the fish, built-in protection. The second spine, so before we get into that, this fish has about 12-ish of these fin spines on this first dorsal fin, part of what helps define it. All of them have different numbers. They have a range, so usually about 12 to 15 in this case. We're gonna add some of these spines here going backward from the first one, the second one comes up like this. And then the third one, now I'm leaving a gap between them, notice. They don't touch each other at the base, at, at the fish's body. Well, the first one maybe did a little bit. There's a, there's a bit of a gap there between them. And then we're just gonna add, right now, notice the spacing. They get closer and closer to each other the further we go back and they lean backward more and more. Now, one thing about this dorsal fin, this is cool. These fish can really move these fins. This dorsal fin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And then the last two are tiny. 
11 and 12. They're really short. These, this dorsal fin can be pulled up like a flag kind of thing or bent back flat along the back. So a lot of the time, the fish is swimming around and it doesn't look like it has a first dorsal fin. It's flat along the back. Each of these spines swivels um, and it can flatten out completely or hold up like a wide open flag. And when it's holding up like this, this is the position it takes when it's feeling threatened and, and wants to protect itself against predation. So the, this first dorsal fin not only functions to help stabilize it during swimming, but more so it helps to protect it against uh, attacks by predators. So it'll erect this fin, stand it up these spines, and suddenly it's well protected. In addition, um, it helps to keep it going only so far because there's membranes between these spines. And so each of these spines, except for that first one, so starting with the second one, you'll draw this line coming down from near the tip, down at an angle, and then touching the next spine. That's a thin membrane that connects it, connects each spine to the one after it. So kind of like a, like a fan, you know, like um, it, it, they kind of hold each, they hold together like this, like that. And so you see that, that first dotted line that we drew for the, the shape of the fin overall? Well, th the reason, this is why I said to draw it lightly at first, because that's one that we don't ultimately need. So when you're finished with those spines, you can actually erase out um, that um, that line. Whoopsie, that line that we drew, the dotted line uh, along the edge of the dorsal fin, because that's not actually a part of the fish. That was just guiding us for where we were going to put the tips of these spines and how far out we wanted them to go from the fish. It would look like that. There. That's our nice dorsal, first dorsal fin that is a, a protecting, um, has a protecting feature. One other thing on this fish is what's called a lateral line. So all fish basically have this feature and it's a superpower that fish have. It gives them a superpower. When, because they're living in an environment that is pretty dense, like water, it, it has a lot of, um, density to it. It's, it's thicker. It's not like air, right? It can transmit vibrations very effectively. And this is also why it's very important for us to try to reduce the amount of really loud sound in the water, especially things like, um, like when they do testing, uh, either military testing of, of, of explosives in water or, or, or there are various kinds of acoustic testing they do when they drill for oil and so on to locate um, certain things in the water, sonar as well. Really loud sounds in the water can hurt fish uh, because the water can carry so much more energy in the sound because it's thicker. And they partly hurt fish because fish are well equipped to listen for very faint sounds in water. And they listen partly by means of this special structure called a lateral line. It's a tube that runs along the side of their body that's filled with fluid and that um, changes in, in, in sh shape and size as the water um, hits it, the bound, the, the, oh, sorry, we're at the end of the time here, I just noticed. Okay, that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna draw this line here that comes from the side like that. And it's a tube that's filled with water to helps them to, to um, listen in the water. And pretty much that's it. There's, you want it to, you can add a few more, you know, a nostril to the fish like that. And the front end, just in front of the eye. Um, and then, you know, for the color, you can color this in. It basically has kind of splotches, little dark little splotches on the body here and there. Otherwise, it's bright red or orangey colored and a lighter belly. So that's our fish. And there we have it. And then you draw a Boccaccio rockfish. Awesome. Um, I've got some more details to work out, but it's mm -hmm. coming along. Oh, right on. Look at that. Very, very nice. Very awesome. So while you're you're discussing um, additional things. I'm going to just erase out some of these lines so people will see it as it goes, but uh, I'll hand it over to you now, Siri, and, and thank you very much. I'm sorry about the long time on this one. I, I went longer than I expected. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much for teaching us how to draw this very intricate fish. Pleasure. Um, yeah, it really made me appreciate the complex anatomy, thinking about 
you know, things that I don't think I'd ever thought about in detail before. And uh, so thank you so much. And my pleasure. We invite all of you to do the final touches, erase the those diagonal lines and yeah. things. And then once you're happy, maybe put some color in. Once you're happy with yeah. your, your drawing, uh, we would love to have you email us the photos of your drawings. And uh, we'll be posting them on a gallery that we're going to have on our website. Nice. We have a gallery up for those of you who, are, who participated in the Marmot uh, webinar a couple weeks ago. So if you emailed us your drawing, then it is it should be up in our gallery. Um, and you can scroll through to see what everyone else drew, which is kind of fun. There's some wonderful um, work on that too. Yeah, there were some amazing submissions. So thank you so much because receiving those really made us realize you know, what people got out of it and, and uh, how much they enjoyed it. Um, so the next webinar, we're having a, a third one in this fall series. That is going to be on Wednesday, November 18th from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. So uh, I know some of you will be working, but uh, we're switching back to that time so that teachers can do it alongside students in schools. And on the last webinar, which was during school time, we had about 725 kids wow. drawing along with their teachers. That's we wonderful. couldn't see you all in terms of participant numbers, but we know that teachers were connected and, and working alongside 25 kids or so each. And so wow. we're really excited to have classes as well as parents and grandparents, anyone else who's able to join live November 18th from 10.30 to 11.30. And if you've enjoyed this webinar, um, we invite you to make a donation if you're able to. And you can do that through a link that Maya will be sending in the follow-up email. So on Monday, you'll receive a follow-up email from this webinar, including the recording. So you're also able to do the webinar again or send it along to someone you know who maybe wasn't able to connect live. That's nice. So we'll be having the recording as well as a package uh, sort of aimed at about the grade three to seven range. Um, a package that you can do to learn more details about the Boccaccio rockfish, about its habitat, about its life cycle, about different threats. And unfortunately, the biggest threats to this fish are not predators in the wild, but actually humans. And uh, we, we have a lot of uh, protection in the last years that's in place for this fish, but unfortunately, they're still really susceptible to being caught as accidental bycatch. In, uh, in nets and when bottom trolling happens. So in the package, you'll find information describing ways that we can help ensure that this fish isn't caught um, accidentally. And uh, it, that's especially important because this fish, uh, it lives a very long time. The Boccaccio rockfish yeah, can right. live for about 53 years, Impressive. but they only start breeding um, quite late in their life compared to a lot of other fish. So when they're caught um, too early, a lot of them still haven't had the chance to breed yet. And that makes it very difficult for the population to come back after the huge amount of overfishing that occurred in past decades. So the fish um, has some protections in place now. It's, it's recognized as endangered, critically endangered, but uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to help ensure that it has uh, the ability to thrive in ecosystems um, all the way along the Pacific from Baja, uh, Baja California and Mexico all the way up to Alaska. So for those of you who are in California and Seattle, you also have the Boccaccio rockfish in the Pacific waters off of where you are as well, like we do in BC. And uh, we're just so thrilled that so many people got on today and we're really yeah. excited to see your finished drawings. So you can yeah, add nice. some finishing touches and uh, follow along with what Julius is showing here of some details for shading and and more uh, more different coloring spots and things along yeah. along the side. Um, thank you so much for connecting. And uh, so I'm going to just type the email address in. If you could send your drawings to social at sierraclub.bc.ca. And that email will go to Maya, who was on the call earlier, I think is back now. Um, social at sierraclub.bc.ca. And we'll post those in the gallery on our website. And um, on November 18th is the webinar 
for a very popular species. Uh, we're going to be doing the orca on Yay. November 18th. <laughs> and so that is um, a link that you'll be receiving on Monday. And we invite you to send that along to anyone you know who might be interested, including any teachers uh, that you know or um, parents of kids that you know, maybe they can forward it to their, their child's teacher. Uh, we had a lot of elementary and middle school students participating, and it was really exciting to receive so many drawings from classes. That's nice. And know that classes were learning alongside together. I'm uh, fascinated watching all the color changes going on here that Julius is doing. There you go. There you go. <laughs> really fast coloring. <laughs> uh, you know how many people showed up today? Um, I think we had 86 uh, participants, but then nice. some of those people were multiple people in front of a screen. Right. Well, that's really wonderful. I'm really happy that we were able to get so many people and, and classrooms, even, um, on, on, especially on the days when it's in class, otherwise, too. So, yeah, this is great. And thank you to those who are saying they're going to share with schools. Um, and remind teachers uh, that there's also a package of, uh, like, an educational package that they can use afterwards with their class to follow up. So they don't need to be an expert in the ORCA or in the rockfish or in the marmot, um, we've taken care of some details that they can go over with their class through through educational packages. Right on. Oh, awesome. And uh, we might have people, uh, well, I see people in, in various places typing in the, in the chat box here in San Diego. Oh, wow. It'd be so cool if we could have schools down in the States participating as well. That oh, would be that would be wonderful. Absolutely. And the marmot video, uh, yes, that is available. I'm just gonna, put the link in uh, for that. Do you need so to stop sharing? Keep or? sharing, it looks keep great. Sharing. Okay, yeah. sounds good, right over. One second here, I'm just gonna put the, yeah. here it is. This is the link uh, for the Marmot, the Vancouver Island Marmot webinar that we hosted a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, that was fun. And we're going to be adding, oh, and also back in the spring, um, back in May, Julius did a first webinar with us, um, oh, and right. that was on the Northern Spotted Owl. So I'm going to add that one in the chat box as well. So you're welcome to revisit those webinars and do them alongside folks near and far. Um, if you're not able to be with your loved ones, who would like to participate that live far away and you know due to the times we're in with COVID um you can always send them the link and uh you can draw alongside them and connect virtually that's nice that we're able to do this yeah this good even whether we whether it's necessary for us to stay apart or not one of the the, the benefits of, of of having to adapt to the situation is that these kinds of um webinars have developed quite well um, and that has allowed us to be able to reach so many more people so much more readily than before because more people are now platforms so this is beneficial in any case to, to be able to interact and engage people i'm happy about that aspect of things I'm just adding uh, links now. I think I, I sent them only to the panelists by accident. So um, just give me one second here, everyone. Um, social at sierraclub.bc.ca is the email address for sending your drawings in. And the link for the Northern Spotted Owl webinar, I'm just posting there. For the Marmot, That is the link. The owl one was fun because we also had a bit of the background there um, and a little bit for the marmot too. But um, for this one, we didn't actually get to the background. But if we wanted to, we can put like a, a rocky bottom or, or, or even a, a deep reef. Um, or if it's a young one, then, you know, a kelp forest. There's various kinds of things that we can do with that.
So again, um, I'm just retyping things into the chat box. So November 18th from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. is the Orca webinar. And uh, you'll be receiving the link for that one on Monday in a follow-up email for this webinar. And you'll also be receiving the educational package about the Boccaccio rockfish in that follow-up email from Maya. And you can start sending in your drawings today and tomorrow. And as they come in, we'll be putting them up on the website in the gallery for this webinar. And uh, it's just so exciting to see all the different works that people send in. Yeah, it's wonderful to see those. I, I, I flipped through the, the ones that you guys had posted there and that uh, was some impressive work. So great job, everyone. Really well done. Yes. I'm seeing a sponge reef there. Yes, exactly. Awesome. We also have a coral. This is a very rough coral, but sometimes they exist with deep reefs as well. And rocks. And someone's asking about, um, would it be possible to see the scientific names of the parts? Do you mean the parts oh, yeah. of the fish? Like we were talking about before, so I'll put a couple of these in here. So, um, for example, I think we mentioned uh, a, a few, like the, um, the operculum, right? The gill cover. Uh, and there was also the symphysial knob, which is not present on this fish, but we talked about it. Uh, what else did we say? Mm. Oh yeah, we had the uh, brachiostegal uh, rays. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's that's most of the more the more of the, the, the scientific things that we we, we, we talked about, I think. Yeah, just more. Yeah. Oh yeah, and there was also we, we, we talked about the tapetum lucidum, which is in some fish, I don't think in this one, but in some fish um, is uh, that reflective area in the back of the eye. Yeah, that's some of those anyway. Okay, um, so Sierra or Maya, are you guys still there? Um, maybe we have some. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, uh, do we need to do anything? Do, do I need to do anything else, or is that pretty much the some of it? No, this is everything. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining along, and we're really looking forward to seeing your artwork. There we go. Yeah, I'd love to see what everybody comes up with. It, it, it's always fun to be able to reach out like this. So, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on November 18th at 10.30 a.m. Wednesday, November 18th. Tell everybody you know near and far. And, yeah, uh, let, your, let your teachers know because a lot of them might not know about this. Um, if you like that, um, then, then they may be able to organize, be able to join up via Zoom uh, from the classroom and have... Uh, a bunch of your classmates enjoy it as well. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. See you. Bye.